Fans of the Horus Heresy, thank you very much for joining me for a model and build review of the Legio Custodes Telamon Heavy Dreadnought for the Talons of the Emperor in 30k. And this model is by Forgeworld. So, this model is currently on early release at the time of uh, filming this. I picked this up at Warhammer Fest at the end of May. As of the time of recording this video, so the 1st of June, this isn't on retail release yet. I expect probably within the next month or so it should be available. You can never quite tell with Forge on an early release stuff. Um, so I thought you'd appreciate the opportunity to get an early look at this model, hear some thoughts about what the kit's like and what I think of it. So what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to talk about the kit and the quality of what was presented. I'll go through the build and of course we'll take a look at the model and then I'll finish by some, doing some size comparisons. Now, aha, I hear you say, but Leaky Cheese, what about the rules and tactics? Well, at the moment, uh, we don't have any rules available for the Telamon, so that is a separate video that will come in the future. When I asked the Forge World writer at Warhammer Fest, their view was that once it goes on retail release, they will release a PDF rules file to support the use of the modeling games. So I hope that's what we will see. In the meantime, let's look at the model. And talking of looking at the model, let's get a look at this thing up closer. So this is mounted on a 100 millimeter base. So it's a, it's a big base. Uh, by comparison, a Leviathan Siege Dreadnought is mounted on an 80 millimeter diameter base. I've got three weapon systems. It's got a Cestus, has an Arachnus Storm Cannon, which is this weapon here. Um, then it also has a Spiculus Bolt Launcher mounted up top. So uh, it's got a variety of weapons. This weapon, the Cestus and the Storm Launcher are separate kits and you can choose to either have two Cestus or one Storm Launcher or one of each or two Storm Launchers depending on how shooty you want it to be. I don't know if we'll get any alternate weapons um, where the Bolt Launcher is but we'll see. Anyway, so let's have a look. So we've got some design cues which we've become accustomed to with Custodian Dreadnoughts such as these um, large greaves on, embossed with Imperial Eagles. Um, we have the Imperial Thunder symbol. We have the Bass Relief double-headed eagle on the chest, very nice looking. Uh, as those of you who'd like to play word bingo, um, we have lots of filigree on this dreadnought. And it is also nicely adorned with a number of Aquila. Or is that Aquilae? I'm not sure. Hmm, no one knows the Latin there. These are all of the double-headed variety. And there are many. I mean, there's one here, one here, one here, one here. I mean, they're all over the place. This guy is a quiller mad. We've got some nice design cues taken from the other Contemptor Dreadnought, so the Achilles and the Galatus. Similar head design and the similar sarcophagus design as well. So it's nice to see those design cues being carried through. And then I guess visually, it's a very heavily armoured looking Dreadnought and it's got these very striking, enormous shoulder guards or shoulder armour plates. The whole thing, as we look around it, looks very heavily armoured. And we have these coutes here. There's an additional coute that goes on here. I've not mounted it yet because I think it might obstruct weapon position, so I'm leaving those off. Familiar design trope carried through in the form of the reactor vents, or the power pack and the reactor vents, shall we say, or cooling vents. This cabling is familiar to the Galatus and Achilles dreadnoughts as well. As, is, uh, as we come to expect with these forge wall models, the detail level is absolutely superb. And uh, this is no, this particular, this Telamon is no exception to the custodian range. And here we have the Cestus or the Ram hand in effect. And it's got these enormous heavy digits. I, I, I don't know if you'd really call them fingers. They're very, very hefty weapons. Let's have a, maybe a top down view as well. So a top down view. And, uh, a close upon the um, spiculous bolt launcher. And when it says bolts, I guess it means some sort of missile, but we don't know yet. It's quite an interesting name for a missile launcher. Intriguing. And like the other Contemptors, the whole, all the armour of the Telamon looks like it's very close fitting and tightly integrated, very sophisticated armour design. And that fit, fits with the theme of the Custodians and their esoteric dark age of technology grade equipment. But great model, yeah. That's a, a look at the finished model. Let's now talk about the kit itself. At the time of this review, the kit was 72 pounds, which was uh, about par for the course, I think, on this thing. It's slightly cheaper than the Leviathan Siege Dreadnought. You get a few spare parts in it. I'll show you what spares I do have. 
There's not many, but there are a few, and it's always nice to know that you've got a few spares coming. The first thing is you get an alternate foot, and that's a, this one's flat. I've chosen to use the raised foot here to give it more of a dynamic feel. Um, but yeah, so you do get option. These foot feet are, I don't know if you call them ambidextrous. I don't know what you call a foot that can go on either side, but there's no handedness to them. So you can put the raised foot on either the left, oops. On e you can put the raised foot on either the left or the right side and vice versa. So you get that as a spare. And then in the Cestus kit, you get digits, uh, you get clenched digits as well as extended digits as well. So you could mix and match these digits as a, uh, you know, according to what you wanted or what rude gestures you wanted to try and strike a pose with, with your Cestus. So it's nice to have a bit of flexibility there. There's these two cooter plates, which are designed to go on the side of the storm cannon. However, I'm not attaching them as yet because as you can see that would obstruct the how I've mounted it. So I may just leave those off. I don't necessarily think it needs those. I don't know, I'll have a think about that. But yeah, you get those as well. Uh, let's talk about the build. Uh, kit quality on this was generally very good. I had a little bit more cleanup to do than I would have expected on a brand new pre-release model. And there were several components where there was evidence that molds had already broken in certain places. Fortunately, it was all internal, so the it wasn't externally facing details that were obscured, but it still required cleaning up, particularly one of these greaves, the mold had broken and part of the ankle mount had been disrupted by that, so that needed cleaning out. Then I'll show you, there was some loss of detail on these large pauldrons as well, which you can see here, I filled with milliput. I think the other side was okay. There were a couple, so there was a few little bits of filling. It's no big issue for me, and in terms of the actual finished article, well, you know, a, a few hours of modeling work to do cleanup and filling, the end result looks absolutely superb. And you would expect that off a brand new model. In terms of the actual kit assembly, this is actually quite a straightforward middle model to build. And I think it's an easier build than the Contemptor Achilles, which is my other dreadnought that I've purchased. And I think the ease of assembly is largely related to its bigger size. It's got a very similar number of parts. I think just on account of the fact that the parts are bigger and easier to manipulate, I found it an easier build overall. So that was good. Uh, well, it's not good, it's just how it is. And it's worth noting and acknowledging that. Posability on this model. I, I actually have to say, I was genuinely pleased with the range of motion I managed to get out of this model. From the promotional shots I'd seen of this, it looked like it was gonna be a bit of a static blob. But what I actually found was, and particularly when compared to the Achilles, I actually thought that the legs had a surprisingly good range of motion and the, the hip design is actually probably a bit more open and the waist design is a bit more open than the contemptors from the custodians allowing for a bit better range of motion. And you can see, I've tried to exploit that here with this pose that I've done, it's striding forward and take an aim with its Arachna Storm Cannon and it's it's swinging its arm back in a sort of typical human motive counterbalance way for when you're walking. And I imagine it swung, it's swinging this back to balance the weight of the weapon as, while it walks forward. But yeah, the, the range of articulation I thought was rather good. And this is just one of many ways you could pose this model. I think in terms of the articulation possible, this certainly exceeded my expectations. So uh, hats off to the model designer, which is, I believe, Will Hayes. Yes, of course, yeah, the Dreadnought Man. This is one of Will Hayes's. You have a decent range of motion around the shoulders as well, which is good. Other things to note about the kit, I forgot, but this does come with a computer-style modern set of instructions, which give you a nice exploded diagram of the parts and then a clear sequence of diagrams to put it together. You also get the build instructions for the Cestus and the Arachna Storm Cannon, which is good. If, we, if I'll do additional weapons in the future, uh, we'll have to see. But these instructions were very clear and easy to follow. But as I said, I think the kit was fairly straightforward to build as well. But yeah, all in all, very good experience there. So in building tips, as I often do, I pin my Dreadnought models, and that is for strength and just to make sure they never break. You can stick these things together, just with the articulation provided. And there's some good contact services, but when you have joints which are kind of like, they're smooth contact points that do this, there's always a chance that it could break if uh, stressed. So I put pins in, and what I do is I, I put a pin that goes through the uh, ankle, through the 
lower leg and then up into the thigh and did so one on each side, a pin in each side of the hip and then I also put a pin between the waist and the chest and that's actually all I did. I didn't, there was none, no pins were necessary for the arms because they were actually, the, the mounts on these are so chunky and strong and then the we the weapons were fine as well. So pinning wise actually, it didn't take as much, uh, I, I pinned this less than I pinned my Achilles. Other construction tips, I mean everything fit together very well. The fit on the the power pack, the torso, the upper sarcophagus, and then these large shoulder pauldrons was excellent. Likewise on the missile launcher and the Cestus went together well. Uh, the Arachnus Storm Cannon is essentially one piece, but all very, uh, all very nice and straightforward. Everything was a snug fit. I magnetized my weapon arms. So there is the Cestus and there is a the Storm Cannon. I've done this because my Storm Cannon could go on this side and depending on what the rules are like, I may buy a second sort of Storm Cannon to go on this. Uh, unfortunately, because the Cestus has a hand in this, as is always the case, uh, that can't really go there, unless you don't mind your model looking silly. I've also, as a insurance policy, magnetized my Spiculus bolt launcher. I think this is probably excessive. I don't know if we will get a weapon, extra weapon, but from my point of view, for a few pence for a few magnets and maybe 10 minutes work, it was hardly the end of the world. So I thought, why not? It means I can do that as well at the moment. And that, it's quite neat. In terms of magnets, this is a nice kit because it comes pre-drilled with magnet recesses. I think these would probably ideally fit six by two, six millimeter diameter by two millimeter depth magnets. I had five by three, so I had to drill them in a little bit. That five by three N35 neodymium magnets gave a very, gives a very affirmative fit. And that's nice and strong. And you can see that, that there's no way that that's coming off unless someone gets really abusive or maybe you're in a big earthquake. So yeah, you can magnetize the arms. That's pretty straightforward. And it's nice that the sculptor, as was the case in the Achilles, and we've seen increasingly in forge wall kits, they are integrating magnet recesses into the design. So, and, and you know, and I hope we see more and more of that from forge wall on appropriate kits because it's a really neat feature to get. And I think in terms of build tips and hints, that's uh, that's really it. The real takeaway from that, on again, on me, and the thing that really delighted me with this model was the posability I got out of it from a model that I was expecting to be somewhat static and immobile looking. It actually, you know, for me, for something so big and heavily armoured, it's pretty dynamic looking and it doesn't look clumsy at all. The larger pieces of this kit, along with the ease of assembly, made this a really fun dreadnought to assemble. I normally think that forge or dreadnoughts are fun, but this was a really good one. Let's now do some size comparisons. So I've got a, a smorgasbord of comparators here. We're going to stick to the walker category and infantry because that's what we're really interested with. And we've let, let's see how big this thing is because you probably get in the field now from the 100 millimeter diameter base that this is a beastie. I'm going to start off with standard humans. I've got a member of my survivors of the dark age of technology militia. This is one of my Victoria miniatures, female Arcadian guard models. My review of this and note you guys and girls, I do read all my comments and I always try to accommodate suggestions where you made. Someone said it would have been nice to have a comparison of these Arcadian guard against the normal guardsmen. Well, I haven't got any modern guardsmen, but I did go digging and look who I found. For all the way back from 1988, one of, I think it was 88, one of the original plastic guardsmen in an equally 1988 paint scheme. Probably not the worst eyes ever for uh, someone who was not very many years old, but yeah, look what I found, so yeah. So there you go, whoever was asking about the size comparison between the Arcadian Guard and the normal Guardsman, there you go, a bonus little review for you there. Making the main comparison, uh, yeah, this thing is, um, it is enormous, but let's, let's go straight up, moving on from a human to an Astarte. This is my converted version of Nayak Dreyer, the Iron Warriors hero to traitor, loyalist turned traitor turned loyalist. He, but he's in our hands, he's a Pravian model. I've whipped a bolt gun onto him because, you know, firing a bolt gun but one hand is badass. Pop him alongside the Telamon. He makes some standard humans look small, but, you know, the Telamon is three times his height, if not more. The Telamon is an enormous machine. Okay, let's scale it up a bit. Let's do something Terminator sized. So here we have the original Terminator Space Marine from 1988 by Games Workshop. 
and I thought this might be, you know, a little bit, this is a, a, a bit of an oddity. I've got a squad of these for my Iron Hands Legion as something a bit retro. Terminator's a bit bigger than the Pravian, but it's still completely dwarfed by the Telemon. Before we move on to Walker comparisons, let's just take one of the Telemon's comrades who is still fully functional in body as well as mind. And here we have a Sagittarium Guard. Uh, this is the four-drawled um, plastic conversion model. And I'm just going to move... Let's kind of like do this as a bit of a size pyramid. Yeah, so the Custodian Guard is slightly bigger than a Terminator, but still dwarfed alongside his sarcophagi interred companion. It's a big unit, this is. Big units need big comparisons, so let's move on to the Dreadnoughts and equivalent. So let's have something that is standard Dreadnought sized, and for that I'm going to, uh, and also to keep our Mechanicum fans handy, we've got a Castlax Battle Automata. Hmm. If you ignore the Battle Automata's weapon, the Telemon is almost twice its height. Bearing in mind the Telemon is striding here and the Castlax is stood upright, I think it's actually quite accurate to say the Telemon is twice the height of the Castlax. I mean, the Castlax can't even reach its, its head, whereas the Telemon can nicely whack it, a little bit of a slap, probably. Can you slap with a Cestus? I don't know. Go oh, for something bigger the Astartes have to offer. And here we have um, a Contemptor Mortis of the My Iron Hands Legion, which is uh, all about the assault cannons. You know, how many barrels is enough? 12, maybe. It's a bit better. Now, bear in mind, this guy is stood on this terrain piece, so he looks a bit taller. Telemon is still dominating the size comparisons. I, we're going to have to go a stage bigger, so let's move it up another notch and move to the heavier class of walkers. I think probably what is next is the comparison that you're all waiting for, and that is none other than the Leviathan Siege Dreadnought. Arguably, this is a war machine from the armory of the Astartes that arguably the Telemon has been created to deal with, uh, as many custodian units are designed to destroy the Astartes if, if necessary. Yeah, so here we have Leviathan, he's packing his Siege Drill, and the new and extra deadly Grav Flux Bombard, well, in 8th edition at least. Hmm. So, how does this compare? Well, height-wise, the Telemon is a much taller, sleeker, upright machine, and it makes the Leviathan look somewhat boxy and clumsy by comparison. However, the Leviathan also has got a certain stout sturdiness and chunkiness to it, the angular lines that are familiar with on a Starte's war machine. So, interesting comparison there, and price-wise, this is actually a little bit cheaper than one of these. And this is a good demonstration that bigger is not always more expensive with, for with Forge World. A really key, important part of a kit cost is the number of components. And the Leviathan has got a lot of parts in it between the arms and the body and the main dreadnought. Whereas the uh, Telemon has fewer and that's why it's actually a cheaper model than this guy. So uh, an interesting thought there on model pricing as well. But the Telemon stands for a fair bit taller than the, even the Space Marine Leviathan. I think there's one more good comparison I can make with the models I've got here. Again, this should please our Mechanicum fans. And here we have a Thanatar Siege Automata. So this is the heavy class of the, of the, of the Mechanicum's war robots. Now we've got something that actually goes a bit the other way. And actually the Thanatar is bigger than the Telemon. And the Thanatar is bigger in every regard. It's a, it's bulkier, it's... I think if it was stood upright, it's probably a slight bit taller because my, my this Thanatar has got a very wide splayed leg stance. So it's got lost quite a bit of height through that, that pose. So it's probably a bit taller and certainly bulkier. Interestingly, again, these two models are of comparable cost. I think this is only a couple of pounds. I think the uh, Thanatar is actually the same price as the um, Leviathan. That kind of interestingly puts the Telemon smack bang in the middle between, for me anyway, in between the Leviathan and the Thanatar and the size stakes. Now, the, what's really interesting, of course, though, is what are the capabilities going to be like of a Telemon? We don't know this yet. I'm going to speculate a little bit. I mean, Custodian War Gear is very sleek, it's very deadly, it's qualitatively the best. However, thinking back to the Custodian Contemptor Dreadnoughts, the, the Achilles and Galatus, while superior to the Contemptors, were only marginally and incrementally better. And it was in, 
it was in sort of their armament was be a bit better although more specialized they had a little bit more armor on the rear they had a slightly better invulnerable save in close combat and their combat stats were better so their weapon skill and their initiative values etc they were all a bit better than the contempt but their main defensive stats and overall firepower probably it, it's not a massive it's not the massive qualitative step up that you get when you look at space marines compared to actual actual custodian warriors so i'm wondering if we're going to see something similar with the telemon compared to leviathan dreadnought or is the telemon going to be quantitatively superior to the leviathan and, and noticeably better in its capabilities i don't know we will have to see it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting though and i'm uh, i'm very excited to see those rules so there you have it that's my model and build review of legio custodes telemon heavy dreadnought by forgeworld what do you think um, of this new super class dreadnought it's the biggest dreadnought we've ever seen in terms of its height for any force ever so it's quite intriguing but i don't know what do you think of it do you like the model do you think it's going to be interesting in the game i'll be interested to hear your thoughts in the comment section thank you very much for watching i'll speak to you next time and goodbye help i'm a telemon dreadnought horus has shot me with his shrink ray help me